Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is October 10th, 2017. And as always, I am very excited to have our guest with us today. Uh, for those of you who have been following us, you'll know that we've been doing a little series on uh, addiction, um, kind of within uh, a Mormon context. And so uh, for those who've been following, again, we interviewed uh, a wonderful young man named Thomas about his opiate addiction as a married Mormon. Um, he's still remaining active in the church at this point. We talked about his experiences. Then we talked to Graham, uh, another uh, wonderful, courageous young man who talked about his opiate addiction. Um, both of those gentlemen uh, you know, started with, oh, let's just say, prescription opiate uh, medication and then moved to heroin at some point. Uh, really appreciated those two interviews. And then we also interviewed uh, Kirsten and David Udy. Uh, David uh, became addicted to alcohol after his faith crisis and transition. So that interview was about mixed faith marriages, but also about uh, alcoholism. And again, I just love talking to Kirsten and David. That was really powerful. And during uh, during those interviews, I was just really fortunate to have um, uh, Dr. Dan Lonergan uh, reach out. And without giving too much away, uh, uh, Dr. Dan Lonergan is uh, an expert in um, addiction. He's an anesthesiologist. He works in conjunction with Vanderbilt uh, Medical Center, which is, a, a, as far as I'm concerned, a top-notch medical institution to be involved with. He specializes in pain management and addiction. He's also been through his own uh, faith crisis and transition. Uh, he's currently in what he would describe as a mixed faith marriage of sorts. And so the interview is going to be basically two parts. Part one is going to be uh, Dan talking about his own journey. So for those of you who are always interested in uh, the faith crisis topic, many of you have said, can we just have more just normal people talk about their faith transition doesn't need to be celebrities or, you know, extra special people in any way. Uh, the first part of this interview is going to address that need. Um, uh, unless, of course, Dan, you're going to describe yourself as extraordinary. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just being silly. Uh, the second part of the interview is, uh, um, is going to be talking specifically about Dan's experiences as an expert in, uh, in uh, pain management and on uh, addiction. So the, that's going to be the agenda for today. We are broadcasting live through Facebook Live. So we welcome everyone who is joining us. We want to encourage those who are joining us live to please consider posting questions or comments in the Facebook live stream. And we can incorporate your questions or comments into today's interview. That always makes it more fun. Before we jump into the interview, we just have some very quick announcements. I'll make them as fast as I can. If you want to support what we do, follow us on Instagram or Twitter at Mormon Stories. Please like us on Facebook right now if you haven't. Go to your Facebook page, like the Mormon Stories Podcast Facebook page, and give us a positive review. Uh, those positive reviews are really important so that people know that we're a good place to go. And if you want extra brownie points, please go to iTunes, log in, and give us a positive review. Uh, positive reviews on iTunes make us. Um, uh, just it helps make our podcast successful. And then, of course, finally, as far as ways you can help us, we really appreciate people who are able to donate to support what we do. We have a whole staff at the Open Stories Foundation that makes all this possible. And your donations go to support the staff and the objectives and the mission of the Open Stories Foundation, which is to provide support for people uh, experience or impacted by religious transition. We have several podcasts and a nonprofit, and your donations make all that possible. So please don't be a freeloader. Please uh, support us if you can. Less than 1% of our listeners actually donate. So if you enjoy our programming and listen, I'm going to guilt you, guilt trip you, and ask you to please go right now to mormonstories.org and sign up for a $10 or $25 or $100 a month donation, whatever you can afford, because that would really help. Uh, another couple quick announcements. We do have a job position we're hiring for. We're hiring a web developer, somebody with WordPerfect uh, experience, who's got web design experience. It's ten dollars. It's ten. It's about ten hours a week minimum, uh, fifty dollars an hour. If you know a great web designer who really knows Word uh, Word 
uh, press, and pref preferentially, uh, preferably, if they're a Mormon Stories fan or an Open Stories Foundation uh, podcast follower, I think they'd be a really good fit. So please email us at openstoriesfoundation at gmail.com with some references, with a resume, with some links to some of your work. We would love to evaluate you for that position. And then finally, we have several events coming up. October 27th, Finding Spirituality and Improving Mental Health During and After a Faith Crisis. Uh, that's in Utah County, again, October 27th. Uh, November 17th in Utah County, Navigating Healthy Relationships. That's marriages, uh, uh, believing family and friends, children. Uh, that's a half-day workshop, November 17th. We're coming to San Francisco, November 9th through 10th. We would love to see you there for those interested doing a Mormon Stories workshop. And uh, next year in the fall, October 24th through 28th, uh, we are going to be doing a cruise in the Bahamas. And we'd love for those of you who want to join us to please join us. Thanks for your patience as we do these announcements. Uh, these are the ways that we keep the Open Stories Foundation alive. So we really appreciate your, your patience uh, when you do that. So um, uh, with that, uh, it is now time to jump into the main part of our interview. Uh, so to begin, Dr. Dan Lonergan, uh, welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thanks, John. It's great to be here. Um, all right. So uh, as I've introduced, as I've already introduced to our listeners, um, we, uh, we're going to divide this up into two parts. We're going to first talk about your experiences as a Mormon and your own faith crisis transition and uh, navigating a, a mixed faith marriage and what that's been like. Then we'll sort of end that part and we'll start part two about, you know, tips uh, from an expert overcoming addiction. So if it's okay to begin, why don't you just kind of introduce yourself a little bit, just so that people kind of know a little bit more about who you are and what made you show interest in this podcast episode okay. or series? Um, I would say I'm probably one of your very ordinary guests. I'm not a celebrity or anything <laughs> like that. Um, I grew up in uh, just outside of Kansas City and also spent uh, some time in high school in Chicago and um, do, do you want to just to start from the from my upbringing or you want a general introduction? give a super quick overview just so people kind of know your uh, your experience and background so I'm a, a physician I work at Vanderbilt Medical Center um, I'm a specialist in pain and addiction um, I'm also a Mormon Stories listener. I've been spending uh, many, many hours in the car with John <laughs> over the last several years. Uh, I think I've missed, listened to most of the episodes. Um, and in hearing the series on addiction, I just, uh, you had a lot of questions that I feel like uh, I have answers to. So I reached out and thought maybe I could help you uh, clarify some of your questions and, and talk a little bit about addiction and talk about some of the stigma behind addiction, um, especially in religious communities. And I think it'll be a pretty productive uh, discussion. Beautiful. And we want to thank Wayne, who's joined us, who says he's uh, sending a donation right now. Mary Lou's joining us from Tucson. Thanks for joining us, Mary Lou. Uh, lots of uh, cool people have joined us so far. We've got about 50. So, all right, Dan, let's start with just your kind of Mormon background. Tell us a bit about your Mormon upbringing. Um, so I think my childhood was kind of the Mormon dream. Uh, I had three older brothers. Um, we were just a solid Mormon family, very active. Uh, my dad was the bishop in our ward outside Kansas City, and we just had a great life. My mom stayed at home with us. Um, I just have wonderful memories growing up in the church. I uh, no abuse. We were very well cared for as children. Um, had a great ward growing up. We were very close. Uh, I think our youth group when I was 12 had over 100 youth in it. Uh, so oh we my very, gosh. What, what city was this? This was in Overland Park, Kansas. Okay. And we were just very tight as a youth group. And uh, it was very much my identity uh, being Mormon. I was very proud of it. Uh, it's just something that really defined me as a, as a teenager. Okay. Um, and, uh, did you, 
Um, did you have any kind of formative spiritual church experiences in your teen years that really, that really kind of were important for you? Yeah. So in the summer, I always did EFY. Um, and that was always a very spiritual experience. Also, every year we went to Nauvoo and we took part in the pageant. And that was also very spiritual. Um, and then just the social interactions that I had were very uplifting. Um, I wouldn't say that I had any pivotal moment where I became converted or anything like that. It was just a, um, immersion in the culture. And, uh, that was my identity. The seminary graduate. Yeah. Yeah. Eagle, Eagle, Eagle scout, Eagle scout, all four years of early morning seminary. Um, you know, I was in it to win it. Okay. Did you try and gain a, a strong testimony as a, as a youth? And if so, did you do Moroni's promise? Did you get it in other ways? Did you never get a witness that you wanted? How was your testimony forged in those teen years? Yeah, I'm a fairly obsessive person. So I was always being very proactive about doing what we were told and trying to be obedient and trying to gain a testimony. And um, I, I remember feeling like I needed to read scriptures and pray. And um, I, I don't recall, you know, specifically employing Moroni's promise as a teenager, but um, I think that came later as I, as I got ready to go on a mission and was at BYU. That, that were, you tormented, were you tormented by kind of guilt and shame as a teen? Any of the sort of less than positive side effects of being a Mormon kid? Absolutely. <laughs> it, and it's interesting because I was actually a really good kid. Um, I like looking back, I just, it's laughable the things I was guilty about, but I was so obsessed with being perfect and being good and being obedient that I was always feeling guilty about something. Okay. And so overall, was that a problem or was it just kind of an unfortunate minor side effect of being a Mormon teen? I'd call it pretty minor. I don't think it really, uh, I don't think it ruined me. I think okay. it, it may be more just a product of my personality and the fact that I'm fairly OCD and I had a tendency to take religion overboard as well. Okay. And so the, to flip side, the most positive aspects of your Mormon experience as an adolescent Sounds like it was just the social interaction. What else would have been yeah. the, the, the most important parts for you as a Mormon teen? The community was definitely a huge bonus. Also, the identity, um, especially in high school. I was, uh, I think, one of two Mormons at my high school uh, outside of Chicago. And um, I took a lot of pride in having that identity and... Um, felt very comfortable in the fact that I didn't drink alcohol and, um, you know, was, was very happy with the fact that I, I stood apart and, um, was peculiar in my beliefs. Okay. So you were able to kind of live the standards and you enjoyed that. Yes. Okay. Um, anything we should talk about before we talk about your mission? Uh, no, uh, Did, pretty much covers it. your, your BYU experience was how was your BYU experience? Yeah, so I graduated early from high school and went to BYU and had a great experience there and then actually spent six months at BYU Jerusalem. Oh, uh, before your mission? Before my mission, yeah. That's not normal, is it? Not really, but since I had a year and a half at BYU, I was able to do that um, third semester um, at Jerusalem, and that was... Uh, good mission prep. Okay, excellent. Um, anything you want to say about that BYU Jerusalem experience? Um, we, it was, it was amazing. We, we traveled. Um, I think I had a much more naive view of religion at that point. And as we studied the Old and New Testament, a lot of the questions that I would later have in life, I don't remember thinking about when I was in Jerusalem and when I was studying um, the 
you know, especially the Old Testament. Um, questions that I would later have, things that would really bother me. I don't remember when I was 18 years old having those same concerns. I think I was just more about traveling and having fun. And the culture at BYU Jerusalem was very tight. The, you know, we just um, had great friends there and it was fun. And, you know, we were exploring new places. So uh, there definitely wasn't anything to complain about. What what were your spiritual highlights at that Jerusalem Center experience? Were there any spiritual highlights for you? Um, I I opened my mission call on on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. That was that was a very spiritual experience. Um, but interestingly, I, I didn't have a lot of spiritual experiences like walking where Jesus walked or being in the Garden of Gethsemane or. Um, I, I don't remember having really profound, uh, spiritual experiences. Um, not that it, it wasn't spiritual at all, but, um, but I just wasn't really overwhelmed by anything that I can remember. Okay. All right. Anything about your mission? Where'd you serve your mission? Uh, Australia, Adelaide. Okay. Anything about your mission experience that's kind of worth, uh, worth mentioning as a part of your story? Um, I, I've listened to several of your other podcasts where you talked about, um, you know, like uh, Brazil and I don't recall where you served your mission, but you talked about some of the pressure to baptize and, um, there was some of that culture in my mission as well with the Aboriginal, uh, people. And, um, there were some problems that we had in our mission with, um, basically missionaries buying um, kids fried chicken and taking them down to the river and having group baptisms and um, just huge numbers of, of inactive members of the church and, and people who weren't converted. And uh, there was a big push while I was on my mission to clean that up. Um, and it caused a lot of controversy and um, you know political discord in the mission. Okay. And so you were more of the cleanup side or did you participate in some of that? The cleanup side was more in the second half of my mission with a new mission president. Okay. Um, and the, the new mission president was highly criticized because baptism rates fell um, so dramatically. And I was able to, I was an assistant um, with him. And so I was able to kind of see the inside story of what was going on and and uh, that was kind of my first exposure to church politics. And it was very eye-opening for me. And I, I learned through that experience that I have a distaste for politics. I, I did not enjoy being involved in that. Got it. Okay. Any other experiences from your mission worth mentioning? Was that, was that baptism thing of a faith crisis for you? Where it, if you were to later have a faith crisis, were there anything, any other things that sort of became cracks in your testimony that started on your mission or not really? Yeah, actually, it, the first huge crack in my testimony was, was kind of a subtle experience when I was tracting. I, I actually, in the middle of Adelaide, Australia, tracked it into a Seventh-day Adventist minister from California. And he was actually an African-American gentleman. And... Uh, he stood at the door and and talked to us, and he asked me, you know, hey, what's the deal with the blacks and the priesthood ban? And um, and I kind of hemmed and hawed and kind of gave him, you know, well, we don't really know, and kind of the typical Mormon explanation. And and he says, Here, here's what I don't get about you guys. Why don't you just admit you were wrong? Why don't you just admit you made a mistake? and say you're sorry, and move on. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't really have an answer for him. We ended up leaving, and I went and sat at a park bench. I just told my companion I needed a minute, and I just realized he was right, that, that I was making all these excuses for something that was just wrong. And um, it was, had a very profound impact on me. And, and I wish I could talk to him um, because that was a very short five minute interaction 
but he completely uh, made me realize that I was making excuses for something that I didn't need to make excuses for. And that it was, and I realized at that point that it was okay to just say, yeah, that was a mistake. Yeah. I'm sorry that my religion was involved in that. Um, and I didn't need to try to bear that burden on my shoulders. So maybe you didn't like being an apologist. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Yeah. Although I dabbled in it for years. Right. Okay. So that, so you would say those might've been a few cracks. Uh, anything else you want to mention about your mission experience? Overall, it was a great experience. I, I learned a lot. Um, I don't regret those two years at all. Um, and I, there were other things that cracked my testimony on my mission. Um, you know, I often had the sense that we were manipulating people. I, I used to call the commitment pattern the manipulation pattern mm -hmm. because I felt that um, a lot of the techniques we were employing were more sales techniques than anything. And I, it made me very uncomfortable while I was on my mission that um, we were using some of the techniques we were using in order to gain converts. Yeah. Okay. So the manipulation of the sales tactics. Yeah. Um, did, so if you worked with Aboriginals, is that what you said, Aber or just your mission, not you? Yeah, I did as well. So Were I there any about, issues any issues around race that came up in the mission? Race or racism or not really? Um, I, th I think there were, but I don't know that I was really attuned to it at the time. Um, and I don't want to revise yeah. the history and make things up but no, at, that's, that's at the time good. aside from the history of, of racism in the church in terms of the 1978 policy um i encountered that frequently because people would bring it up but um and, and there were also cultural um barriers with the aboriginal people and the caucasian australians there were huge cultural divides and how much of that was was racism and how much of it was just, you know, cultural barriers and, uh, you know, I, I'm not really sure. But I, I didn't really see any blatant um, racism while I was there. Do you have a sense for whether Aboriginal Australians were allowed to be baptized prior to 1978? Um, my understanding is that that was not pursued prior to 1978. Okay, so it affected them even though there wasn't necessarily African blood per se. Yeah. True. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, I, I'm. So, where'd you go to college after your mission? So I went back to BYU. Okay. Anything? Anything of note happened on your mission that um, at BYU that's worth mentioning? Um, I took religion classes and. Um, I can remember in some of my religion classes just feeling like things were buttered up or that we weren't thinking critically or, you know, just feeling like as I'd read the history, just having concerns that things weren't as I always thought they were, but I was very, I don't know if I was scared. I was very hesitant to really pursue deeply into those concerns that I had. Um, yeah. I generally try to stay with the recommended books and I consider myself kind of a scholar of Mormonism, but I wasn't willing to branch out into more secular histories. Okay. So you were pre-med at BYU? Yeah, I was a neuroscience major. Pre neuroscience. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, did you meet your wife at BYU or after? Yeah, actually, my wife and I knew each other when we were kids, and then we met back up at BYU, and she was actually at um, uh, UVSC at, at the time. Okay. And, um, and we started dating, and we dated for about uh, almost two years and then got married. We had a very long courtship. Yeah, at, super long. It's right, e egregiously long. Right. Um, okay, so by the time you left BYU, you were, you were married? Yeah, so I got married a year before I left BYU. Okay. And then was it med school right after BYU? Yep. We moved straight to St. Louis and, and uh, did med school. All right. So when did your faith crisis start? 
So my faith crisis sort of developed, well, actually, I, I should say something that's relevant to part two. While I was in med school, my oldest brother uh, passed away. Mm, sorry. Um, so my, f- my father found him at four in the morning um, on the couch. And my oldest brother had had some chronic pain issues and had, had several brain surgeries and was on some pretty heavy medications to treat his pain. Mm. And, you know, it's never really been conclusive how he died, but basically it's most likely that he died of, of sort of a drug combination or drug overdose type of situation. So that was when I was in my second year of med school and that heavily impacted my family because we cut it kind of had this really tight um, family. And then this tragic event that happened, I think really changed the dynamic a lot. My parents have never been the same because they, they continue to grieve his loss. And it also gave me a whole new perspective on um, addiction, um, pain medicine, how, um, these things can kind of creep up on people and how tragedy can strike, uh, when you don't expect it. Mm -hmm. So that really framed my ways of thinking over the next, you know, I guess it's been, you know, 14 years, 13 years. I'm so sorry about your brother. Thanks. Uh, Is there a sense that it was uh, just an accident or something else? It was definitely an accident, but, um, you know, my sense is that he was using a lot of medications to treat his symptoms and the combination of those medications, maybe, um, maybe using too much of them had a, had a fatal consequence. Got it. Okay. So that shaped your focus in med school. Yeah, definitely. Okay. What else do you want to share up until and including what, you know, how your faith crisis began? So in med school and residency, we really learn to think critically and to, you know, there's a big focus on using evidence-based medicine, on using science, on not just believing in things, but making decisions based upon what the evidence shows and not based upon our anecdotal experiences or our emotional experiences. And so I learned this way of thinking and throughout med school and residency, the levels of cognitive dissonance increased. Right. Where as I was learning science, the things I believed in my religion were not lining up. And do you remember, do you remember any examples um, that were kind of important to you at the time as this conflict know, was arising? I was always curious about the word of wisdom examples because I'd always said on my mission, you know, the the word of wisdom was inspired and all these things have been over the years backed by evidence. But, you know, then I'd read studies like, oh, a glass of red wine is actually good for your heart. And, you know, um, there were things that I would learn that maybe weren't consistent with what I believed in. And, you know, obviously things like evolution and, um just as you learn the history of the world and how things have evolved, some of the things um, in the Bible just kind of become more uh, difficult to believe. Yeah, sure. Kind of the literalistic Mormon stuff. Yeah. Age of the sure. earth, global flood, evolution, Adam and Eve. Yeah. So I was abandoning things like that. Um, you know, every year I was just abandoning all these beliefs that, you know, I just didn't accept anymore. So I was becoming very um, nuanced in my beliefs and and unwilling to accept some of the older, you know, arguments about um, the way things were. So you kind of, you were kind of becoming liberal. Yeah, for sure. Did you have any role models for being a liberal Mormon where you kind of felt permission to go that route? Uh, Any inspirations, role models, anything, books? Podcasts, yeah, I would, whatever. I would home teach with a professor at Vanderbilt, um, and I, I think he lives in your area now. I think he's at Utah State. 
Um, but we would secretly talk. We would sit, sit out in the car outside my house and, and I didn't even want to go home teaching, but I wanted to sit and talk with him about all these things I was dealing with. And he was very liberal in all of his beliefs and he was a convert. And so he would help me sort through all these things. And he made me feel like it was okay that I was abandoning these beliefs and becoming more liberal and I could still be a good Mormon. And he kind of made me feel at ease with, with some of these, uh, with some of this progression in my ways of thinking. How'd you guys find each other? How'd you identify each other? Well, we, we were in the same ward and we were both at Vanderbilt. And so we would, we would talk a lot and I, I quickly, you know, he was very open about how liberal he was. So okay. I felt comfortable in sharing with him some of my thoughts and it turned out they lined up. Uh, so that kind of illustrates the value of people being vocal at church. If those who attend, when you're vocal, one of the positive things that comes from that is it can allow other people to find you and to find a friend that they can talk Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so um, so you've got this friend, you're becoming more liberal, you're starting to have doubts. How did it progress? So through residency was so difficult, and we had moved to Nashville. I did residency at Vanderbilt, and it was so difficult because I was at the hospital all the time. And so there were many Sundays where I didn't go to church. I was basically becoming more immersed in a, a more secular culture, spending a lot more time at the hospital um, and relying less and less on the church community. When And, and if someone was going to say, oh my gosh, well, that's it. You, you stopped reading the scriptures. You stopped going to church. Uh, that's what happens. That's what causes you to lose your faith. If somebody wanted to kind of paint that as a negative script and as a cause, how would you respond to that? Well, that's what I felt as well. So that's exactly what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. And so when I was asked in 2014 to um, teach, or I, I guess it was 2015, I was asked to teach early morning seminary. And uh -oh. for, right. And so, so my thought was, okay, this is my chance to kind of get back into it. Right. This is my chance to kind of immerse myself back into the scriptures and um, kind of give back to the church and, and really delve into the gospel. And so that's why I accepted that calling was because I thought my my time at the hospital and becoming more secular was was kind of damaging me spiritually. And as a highly conscientious sort of OCD personality type, that probably was always ca causing cognitive dissonance in the back of your mind, right? True. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. okay. So, so, so you, the, the fatal seminary teacher calling. <laughs> yeah, it's happened to a few of us, I hear. <laughs> so I took that calling and I was really dedicated with it. Um, it was Old Testament to just make matters worse. So, um, so I started teaching seminary and within – Within a few weeks, I just started realizing how how far gone I was. So I told my seminary class that I didn't believe in Noah's Ark. And I mean, I know that's not part of the curriculum, but I just got up there and I said, look, I, I just can't accept this story. I mean, this is just ludicrous. And so my question was, can I still be a Mormon? Can I still be a good Mormon and not even believe in Noah's Ark? You know, and everyone in the class, you know, the new generation, they're pretty liberal. So they were fine with it. But you're, so, you're off script. If I'm, yeah, if I'm your CES advisor, I'm thinking, as I'm monitoring, you know, because they do, they send out evaluators. I'm yeah. thinking as, I'm, as a moderator, uh, uh, Dan's off script. We got to get Brother Lonergan back on script. <laughs> yeah, and they had definite concerns about me. I had the moderator's observing me more than once and you know i have a beard and i ride a motorcycle and you know i'm a academic uh you know i work at an academic institution so i was on the radar from the beginning for sure yeah so um i um when i was teaching seminary in november 2015 was when the policy came out against the children of gay couples and 
my shelf was already about to fall. But this policy came out and it just was astounding to me because I thought we'd made so much progress in the past several years and then this policy came out and I just couldn't understand what the church was doing. But what really cracked me was getting on Facebook and just seeing how my LDS friends were defending it and talking about how it was about love and basically without any critical thought at all within the first day or two, um, so many people were defending this policy and I just started to realize that the church basically had taught us not to be critical. Yeah. Right. And I, and I just couldn't take part in it anymore. And, um, plus I'm sure you're remembering back to your mission time where you were making excuses and, uh, I wonder if that was bugging you at all, like seeing people do what you had done on your mission that bothered exactly. you. And and since then, I had learned all the details of our history with racism in the church. And I, I know very well the timeline of what happened and kind of how those events unfolded. And, you know, I'm very confident in saying that that was not a revelation and that God was not behind, you know, early Mormon racism. And so I just kind of see this playing out in, in front of my own eyes. You know, it's like history is repeating itself. And I just didn't want to be a part of it. So I'm halfway into my time teaching seminary. And I'm basically starting to talk to my seminary kids about this policy. And the kids are all mad about it, too. Oh, really? They're mad about it? Yeah. Huh. Well, you know, I, I, had, I have some uh, very liberal, you know, I had some very liberal students in the class that were very worked up about it. Interesting. And so we would uh, commiserate with each other. <laughs> so also off script. Yeah. Okay, so you're starting to like go off script with, uh, you know, just just kind of developing relationships with these kids in ways where, you're all kind of raising your eyebrows at each other, kind of scratching your head, wondering what's going on. Yeah. And I, I started to be concerned about the psychology of what I was doing because so much of the CES manuals, if you go through and you look at the purpose of most of the lessons in the CES uh, seminary manuals, it's all about obedience and it's all about perfect obedience. Yeah. And I just started to be very concerned about the message that I was giving these kids because I just knew there's no way they're going to live up to what is expected of them in these, in these lessons. And so I totally changed the tune from being about obedience to talking a lot about mercy and grace and about things that are relevant to them in their lives. And, and uh, it got to the point by the last half of the year that I, I could hardly even teach from the manual anymore because there was basically nothing in it that I agreed with. Yeah. That's hard. So your eyes, really had, hard. Every, your, your eyes had been opened. You yeah. Had, you had and partaken it, of the tree of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. Your eyes had been opened and you couldn't go back to the garden. Yeah. And at the same time, I didn't want to cause some big controversy by quitting. And so I just kind of lived in silence and just tried to hold it all together and finish out the year. And, um, you know, I didn't want anyone to know, but I did secretly in, uh, I think it was February or March after one of my seminary classes, I just had this urge to do something really bad. And I went and I got in a Starbucks drive through and I ordered a cup of coffee. <laughs> oh, that was your apple. You took, you partook yeah. of the apple. Yeah. And, and the crazy thing is I'm, I'm in this Starbucks drive through and I'm just, I'm like looking around, like, is anyone going to see me? And I know how <laughs> ridiculous this is, but I just really, Cause I'm sure your colleagues in medical school were living off of coffee, right? Oh, absolutely. And, and, and I was living off caffeine pills. Oh, wow. I mean, I was, I was taking ever since I'd been in med school. I mean, I had to like take several caffeine pills every morning just to 
just to get by. And I knew it wasn't healthy, but I'm guessing uh, coffee is more healthy than caffeine pills. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, and okay. And so I just I just started to realize as I stopped believing how ridiculous it was for me to be taking these pills every morning to wake myself up when and I just thought, you know what, I'm just gonna have a cup of coffee. And I'm so just curious, why why is co- caffeine and coffee more healthy than caffeine and in, in pills? I'm if you know. Uh, Maybe you don't know. I, I just think the psychology of it is unhealthy to, to be taking a pill and you have this huge surge of caffeine, um, whereas coffee is much more titratable. Right. Right. So you sip your coffee through the morning. You know, it might take me an hour or two to drink a cup of coffee. And I know if I'm getting a little too much and I, I can kind of titrate it to the right level. Right. And I also tend to consume a lot less caffeine with coffee because it's not uncommon that I'll come back at lunch and, you know, most of my coffee is still sitting on my desk and it's cold and I throw it out. But, you know, if you're taking two caffeine pills, you might, you know, that might be equivalent of four cups of coffee, you know, right away in the morning where, you know, if you're drinking coffee, you're just not going to consume that much caffeine. Got it. So, and also just the psychology of of being dependent on pills. Yeah. You know, and it's just Maybe that can be a slippery slope for some. Yeah, maybe. And it's just so interesting that um, I was willing to do that as a believing Mormon, but I wasn't willing to drink a cup of coffee. And, and you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's stupid, you know, yeah. and I just recognized that in myself. And I just realized that my behavior didn't make sense. Yeah, kind of, kind of, and we'll get to this, I'm sure, kind of like, maybe for some medical marijuana would be much more healthy than than opiate, you know, prescribed opiates, and yet a Mormon won't let them do the former sometimes, but would be okay with the latter, and the yeah. latter can become deadly. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to derail. Or, or, or a, a similar example, you might be okay with taking the Xanax at night to help you get to sleep, but you won't have a glass of wine. But the glass of wine is much healthier for you than the benzodiazepine. Right, yeah, totally. Right? And, and that's a very, very um, common problem in Mormonism. Yeah. All right. We've got two comments. We've got the awesome Carson Calderwood, a, a former a Mormon Stories podcast alumni who writes, coffee is theorized to have its correlation to a decrease in morbidity due to all the antioxidants it contains. That benefit outweighs the small negatives of caffeine. So that's Carson, Dr. Cal, Carson Calderwood the dev, uh, weighing in. Hi, Carson. And then Spencer asks you a question, Dan, and I want to thank listeners for making comments and questions, we want to include them. Uh, Spencer asks, you sound like you were a cool seminary teacher. How did your seminary students' attendance progress throughout the year? Um, Also, were your students more interested in your off-script discussion than the lessons they got in Sunday school? So those are two questions. Thanks, Spencer, for writing in. I had 24 students, and all 24 graduated, and we had Nearly perfect attendance. <laughs> so they liked uh, they liked going off script with you. Oh yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, okay. uh, I got a lot of good feedback. A lot of parents were very upset when uh, they found out I wasn't continuing. Okay, very good. All right, uh, I had the same experience. Uh, it's kind of like a Dead Poet Society when students get seminary students get a teacher that's actually awake and alive and curious. Um, and willing to talk about lots of different stuff that's relevant to their lives. They actually enjoy it more, I think. Yeah, it's, it's more stimulating. Um, more relevant. Yeah, and, and they don't sometimes get those discussions at church, so they're really, when, when you have a really critical discussion where you explore a lot of different sides of the issue, um, they really like that, and, and a lot of them were really into it. Uh, Joey asks, were there attempts to censor you during your lessons did anyone telling you to the bishop or did parents start complaining was anyone on to you during that year yeah but i um everyone was pretty good about it Uh, i got a lot of good feedback there were a couple um comments that i had but um that wasn't the majority the the overwhelming majority was that people were happy with what i was doing all right so you that summer tell us again what you did that summer did you bail or what'd you do so Right when seminary finished, I met with my bishop and I told him, basically, uh, I'm not a believer. And I gave him my temple recommend and and told him I'm done. 
So that would have been summer of 2016? Yeah. So a little over a year ago. Uh, yeah. And yeah. you offered your Temple Recommend? Yes. Yeah, a lot of that. people want to keep that just in case they get invited to a wedding or a reception or, you know, some type of missionary farewell. What made you yeah. decide to just let that go and to volunteer it versus have it taken from you? I just wanted to be authentic. I wanted to be honest. And um, I just was okay with letting it go. I've been to, I've been to a wedding since then and done the, you know, walk of shame out outside and not allowed in. And um, so I know what that feels like now and um, I'm okay with it. I'd just rather be honest about with people about what I believe in. And um, I, I just don't want to be manipulative or, dishonest about it sure um a lot of people it's it's not so much you know there's a lot of honest people generally that still don't that still really struggle with this issue and some of it is just weighing the honesty with the collateral damage or the pain or the suffering that'll come from disappointing parents disappointing in-laws disappointing grandparents uh, disappointing siblings and and all that how, how, what did you face? Is, you, is your situation where those things really weren't, yeah, you said you were raised in an Orthodox home. I don't know what your wife's family were like, but to what extent did you feel like you would be paying a, a social or a familial cost from not only giving up your temple recommend, but also just kind of like disengaging with the church? Was that tough for you? It was one thing I was doing was I was listening to these podcasts. So I was learning from other people's experiences, what not to do. And I still made a lot of mistakes, but I was um, kind of recognizing it in other people's stories, some of the mistakes that I might make. And I think I was a little more careful than I otherwise would have been. Um, so that helped me a lot. And there was a lot of pain. Which podcast, um, do you remember any podcast that you listened to either podcasts overall or episodes that were particularly helpful. No pressure if nothing comes to mind. I just, I like to give listeners resources uh, in case there's something that, that's helpful. Yeah, I don't remember any specific ones, but a theme over and over, and, and you've talked about this a lot, is to not just dump all your um, concerns on your spouse or on your parents and not try to convince them um, that Mormonism isn't true or, you know, talk about some of the historical issues that we have or issues in the scriptures that we have um, because they're not necessarily in a place that they're ready to hear that. So I was a little more careful, although I made some mistakes with my wife um, where I unloaded a little bit too much on her and we had some tough times because of that. Okay. So, so with extended family, it sounds like you didn't do the dump. Talk to us about what that was like. How much was your wife aware of your faith crisis that happened over a year or so? How much did you include her versus not? And then what was it like that before or after or during that time where you just uh, ended it with the bishop? So she, I was gingerly letting her know my concerns and kind of dancing around it a lot. And, and she was absorbing it and listening to my experience. I, I got really lucky because her cousin visited from Canada who had been through a faith transition in the year previous. And we were able to sit as a group and talk about his faith transition. And in our discussion, my wife realized that I was basically on the same page as he was. And so it was an indirect way to introduce her to, you know, how far off the rails I was. So it helped having that third party in there to kind of be a mediator and she could look at him and she had respect for him and what he had gone through. And so then she could apply some of that same consideration to what I was going through as well. And it softened the blow a little bit. So others kind of prepared the way a little bit for you, your cousin or your wife's cousin. 
Yeah, she also has a very good friend. Her best friend um, is a very non-Orthodox Mormon um, with very nuanced beliefs. And so that has also softened her over the years to be much more accepting of people who, who don't necessarily fit the mold. So that's kind of uh, inf- data for people as they're trying to decide whether or not to come out. It sounds like what you're saying is every time someone comes out, it makes it easier for others to be authentic. Um, Absolutely. Uh, and so that's just an interesting thing for people who are going through a faith crisis. Whether or not you leave the church, becoming open and, and uh, with, with close family and friends about your transition can be a really helpful thing for others who are going through the same thing. And we laugh about this now, but years ago I had told her, I said, hey, I don't know if I can believe this anymore. I don't know if I can do this anymore. And she basically said, stop being stupid. You know, you're just going through a phase. Stop being stupid. And we both laugh about that now because she didn't really realize how serious it was at the time. Um, but she really just thought she could just tell me to like, eh, stop being stupid. Read your scriptures. You'll be fine. Right, right, right. Okay. So um, once you kind of, so talk about like at what point did, did it really become a stress on your marriage? Like by the time you dropped that bomb, was she like accepting it already? Was she wanting you to do that? And, and you know, to what extent was that kind of finality, that moment of finality in summer of 2016, something that was difficult for your marriage? I think she, my wife's an amazing person. And from the beginning, she always said, I'll always choose our marriage over anything else. I love that. Yes. Will you give her so, a hug from John DeLynn? It can be your I, hug. It can I be will. Your, but it has to be a proxy. <laughs> Say, I hug you for on behalf of John DeLynn. I will do that right when I get home. <laughs> so she, I love it when the spouse chooses the marriage over everything. And she's never wavered on that. She hasn't. So yeah. she has been rock solid, by my side, supporting me a hundred percent of the way. And she tempers me too, because sometimes I get angry about things and, and sometimes I want to um, be really negative. Uh, like, like uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about my faith and I, I mentioned to her that I f- felt like I'd been duped. Because all growing up, I'd gotten a certain message that then historically turned out to be not really the truth. And she says, who were you duped by? And I started thinking about that. And I I don't really have an answer to that. Because everyone we know in Mormonism is a believer. So no one's intentionally duping us. And I think even um, the leadership. I, I can't speak for the leadership in Salt Lake, but I can speak for our local leadership. They're very genuine people. And um, our bishop and our stake president uh, seem like very good men. They've been very good to me. Um, and I really genuinely don't think they're trying to deceive or dupe anybody. So she's been able to give me a good perspective as I've been going through this to not be so negative that I'm just basically um, wanting the to, you know, torch the whole religion and just, you know, be done with it. Cause there are a lot of good things about it. That's great. And that's great. You're able to be open to her uh, feedback, you know? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So, so as you've brought her along, she's been committed to your marriage and has even been a helpful resource for you. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, so from, it's been about a year and a couple months since you kind of, uh, disengaged from your ward, did you stop attending completely? No, I I still go. Um, We go, she teaches Sunday school and she teaches like every other week, a Sunday school class. So oftentimes I'll go with her. Um, So my face is still seen there, but it's usually just to go to her class and then I leave. Um, And I've kind of gotten in this habit of going to Sonic and getting the kids, like I get the whole family food and so then I'm in the church parking lot with like all our Sonic <laughs> and, and the kids actually love it. So they're like really excited that I leave church to go to Sonic. And, oh, you time it. So by the time you get to pick them up, you've got the food. 
yeah, so I've got the food in the car, you know, <laughs> everybody's got their burgers and their drinks. And so it's kind of become a funny family tradition that um, during priesthood, I go and, and get Sonic. So. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Um, and has the ward left you alone? Has, you know, what has it been like for you in terms of how your ward has treated you? Um, we've got some great friends in the ward. Some of our best friends are in the ward. We're still very close with them. That hasn't changed at all. Um, the bishop reaches out to me on a fairly regular basis. He's always been very friendly and supportive. Um, for the most part, I'd say it's been about right. Like they haven't um, been bugging me and um, I haven't gotten a lot of contact, but it's enough to kind of know they care. So I have no complaints as far as that goes. I think, I think they've been playing it as well as they can given the circumstances. And you don't have to deal with like whether or not you say, make certain comments in Sunday school or priesthood just cause you don't go. That's how you avoid that dilemma. Yeah. I had issues with that before where I was making comments and ruffling people's feathers. And um, I just decided I couldn't, I just didn't want to deal with that anymore. So oh, you still, but you still go to sacrament meeting or not? Uh, sometimes, sometimes I'll go to sacrament meeting and then go to my wife's class. And, and my wife is very, okay. she's a very yeah. liberal thinker as well. So I, I enjoy her class. Okay. Um, a lot, a lot of the real dilemmas that people have as they're losing their faith and going through a crisis, especially in a mixed faith marriage is the believer wants, do you, do you have children? I, I guess I, I, I have five kids, five kids. Okay. So uh, a, a lot of the non-believing sort of folks are like, oh my gosh, I, I, I don't want my kids in this, you know, some will say cult, or I don't want my kids exposed to racist, sexist, and homophobic teachings, and they, or, or I don't want my kids raised in a church where I'm viewed as a doubter, as a bad person. And so they get really stressed out and upset about the idea of their kids having continued exposure. Others don't mind. Talk about how you've thought through that yourself. Yeah, we're still kind of going through that. Um, you know, my daughter is seven, um, our, our fourth child, she's about to turn eight. And so it's an issue, you know, is she going to get baptized? Who's going to baptize her? Um, I'm trying to sort through some of that because I'm not going to be able to be, you know, take part in that. Um, now, sometimes or, sometimes a, a bishop will let a non-believer do a baptism. It's only an ironic ordinance and they want you engaged versus not. Uh, have you considered that approach? Just like, Hey, if you'll let me, I'd still like to baptize my kid. Just seeing if they'll let you. Yeah. I, I didn't honestly know that was possible, but um, it definitely I, has happened. I guess I could um, explore that as an option. I'd have to think about it, whether or not I want to do that um, right. Yeah, versus course. having my dad come in and do it or, you know, or, um, someone else, but, um, we also have our two oldest kids are, uh, we adopted from foster care. And so they're African Americans. So that kind of plays into it as well, like with the history of the church and, um, some of the things they've encountered at church and, um, you know, it, uh, our son is 21 and our daughter is a senior in high school. And so they've kind of watched me go through this and, and I think so far it's actually been a pretty positive experience for everyone um, because we've been able to communicate with our children. It's okay what you believe. Um, we, we're not going to force you to believe something. We're not going to force you to go to a certain church. Uh, you're always going to be part of this family. You're always going to be welcome here no matter what. Um, and we've even had discussions with our younger kids about that as well. Like, you know, no matter who you are, as long as you're a, a good member of society and you treat people well, like that's all that matters to us. Um, we're, you know, I don't care what they believe. And, and to me, that's been a really healthy discussion to have in our family. How about the idea? What, what you know, a lot of times the non-believer wants to make sure the kids know about Joseph Smith's polyandry. The kids know about book of Abraham wants the kids to know about the racist past. And there's this tension between believer and non-believer. And I don't mean to characterize your wife as a believer. I'm just setting up the average dichotomy. Um, yeah. uh, you know, how have you guys navigated what, how much to disclose to the kids and when? 
I'm pretty open with the kids. If, if they want to learn, I don't really hold back. I think my wife kind of keeps me in check not to be too negative or be too vulgar or, or, you know, expose young kids to things that, that maybe they shouldn't be exposed to. Cause some of the history is pretty shocking. Um, but you know, uh, my, 11 year old, she's very mature and very curious. And we've had a lot of great discussions about it. She's also a perfectionist like I was. And so I'm able to temper some of that perfectionism and kind of get her to give herself a break. And um, instead of wanting to go to BYU now, she wants to go to Harvard. So that's been a big step. Um, not that I necessarily have anything against BYU, but um, I, th I think she'll be a you know, she's just very bright and I think she's thinking more outside of the box now. And I just enjoy seeing that. And my wife sees the value in that as well. Um, so in a lot of ways, we're seeing eye to eye in ways that you might not expect. And it sounds like it's not a tug of war between you and your, your wife about kind of uh, what the kids should know or not, or how authentic you can be it sounds like she wants you to be authentic, but she can be authentic. And neither of you are feeling threatened that you're trying to win over your kids. Yeah. It's, it's not really been like that. The biggest challenge comes usually on Sunday morning when, when she's getting everyone ready to go to church and I'm kind of like, ah, do I want to go or not? And you know, sometimes we butt heads about that. Like, am I going to be with the family or not? You know, and, and some Sundays I just do not want to go. Like I do not want to be there. I, emotionally I feel like I can't handle it um and sometimes I just kind of have to suck it up and and be with the family and go um and other times she's kind of like hey I get it you know just do your own thing got it okay um but for her I, I for her she's not really concerned about doctrine she's just more concerned about our family and us being together and you know, for her, the gospel is kind of all about just the family. And, you know, if, if someone comes up and tells her that Mormonism isn't true, she's not going to be phased by it at all. Like it, it really is not going to affect her that much. So she may be a more nuanced, active member of the church than, than what we're used to seeing. I'm not sure. But she's a fan. She's a family first Mormon. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. Um, uh, okay. And so things like word of wisdom, you know, a lot of the believing spouses f are really concerned about garments, about word of wisdom, about tithing. Uh, how have you guys, what are you able to share about how you've navigated that? Um, so I pretty much became pretty firm that I did not want to pay tithing. Um, and I was a full tithe payer until I was 38 years old. I'm 39 now. Mm -hmm. I mean, until basically midway through my seminary teaching year, I was a full tithe payer, never missed. Yeah. And I went from being a full tithe payer to not paying at all. And, you know, I just had a lot of concerns about where the money was going. I wanted to see that, you know, I wanted to see where it was going. I wanted to make sure it wasn't going to build a mall or going to build, you know, um, another temple in Utah or, you know, things that I didn't, that weren't relevant to me. So we talked early on when I was going through this crisis and decided that um, sh she was okay with us basically deciding charities that we would devote our time and money to. Um, we started actually contributing to a Presbyterian church um, to a fund that uh, funds clinics in Guatemala. And then we actually went to Guatemala through with those funds and did a medical mission so it's almost like our tithing to that church actually sponsored us to go and spend a week in guatemala and we did medical work in guatemala and it was such a rewarding way to pay tithing <laughs> and she went with you yes and my oh. daughter went with us too oh that's a that's amazing how does your wife get over the guilt does she number one want to have a temple recommend and two how does she get over the guilt of being a free rider of, of benefiting from the church, but not paying for her participation? Uh, I, I don't want to speak for her. I think she does feel like she needs to pay like when the girls go to girls camp and, 
you know, she feels like she needs to make a contribution that she feels is adequate. And then um, I'm not sure she's had to deal with a Temple Recommend interview yet. Okay. Um, and I think she's still trying to sort it all out. So. Got it. Yeah, it's still it's still kind of early a little bit, right? Yeah. Yeah. So and and you know I've kind of I've kind of dragged her along in this process, and she's trying to preserve our marriage and preserve our family, and you know she's been really sensitive about my process and i think you know there's going to come a time very soon where i'm going to have to show the same consideration to her and she may push back a little bit and want to want to do some of those things i'm not sure got it okay so as far as like word of wisdom um you know i've I've very much enjoyed um, trying different wines and different bourbons. And as an addictionologist, I kind of understand brain development and I feel very comfortable um, at 39 years old trying some alcohol and I'm not really paranoid that I'm going to become an alcoholic. Um, but I also have discussions with my kids about the wisdom in some of those guidelines. And, you know, we, somewhat try and play a middle ground there um helping the kids to make decisions based more on science and evidence and how their brain develops and kind of understanding the risks and making decisions that way and not so much based upon something that i don't believe is true yeah like one thing i can tell you as i study the data on disaffection of faith crises that well over a third, I think now, of, of kids raised in the church, uh, of U.S. members raised in the church, uh, are leaving the church. And I think for the, for the younger generations, it's, it's even greater. So I can see a lot of wisdom in teaching your kids responsible, moderate alcohol use, simply because, and just education around it. Because at a minimum, one out of three of your kids is going to leave the church and they can either learn in the home with a good education and good role models, or they can try and learn on their own. And, and sometimes they learn in a, in a le much less safe way. Do you think that's a reasonable, smart thing to think about even for a believing spouse Absolutely. as, as an addictionologist, I ask? Yeah, there's some really good science that you can teach your children to help convince them not to expose their brain to chemicals, especially before they're 21 years old. Ideally, I tell my kids, ideally if you can get to 25 and not expose your brain to chemicals, and I include caffeine in that as well, get, get your brain to 25, your brain's fully developed, all those pathways are well established, and your chances of becoming addicted to any chemical beyond the age of 25, if you've not been exposed to it, are very slim. Uh, I'm not saying that that's impossible, but people who are exposed to opiates and alcohol and marijuana in their teenage years when their brain's in, in development are at much higher risk of becoming addicted to those substances later in life. Got it. That sounds really smart. Yeah, and, and my kids seem to respond to that a lot better than saying like, hey, there's this rule that we don't know why it is, but God says to do this, and, and this prophet in Salt Lake says to do this, and you should do it because you need to be obedient. Um, if, if your child has a faith crisis, you don't want them just you know, going crazy because all of a sudden they think it doesn't apply anymore. So you're saying have reason be uh, an authority for them, not just some white old dude so to speak. Yeah, I would say reason is, is more convincing and it's, it's more lasting. And it, it also gives them a better, you know, when they're telling their friends why they don't drink, I mean, maybe that's a better excuse than, um, you know, trying to explain some religious belief. So yeah. I, I think it's different for every child. But um, for, for my kids, it seems like that's worked pretty well. Um. Are you comfortable talking about garments and how you guys navigated that? Because that always comes up. Yeah, I just, I do think it's fascinating that underwear is such a big deal. Um, I, I love riding my motorcycle 
And I can tell you when I stopped wearing garments, I like went out on a motorcycle ride and I was like, I knew it was not rational, but I was like terrified. And um, I just had to get over that. So, um, and I love wearing normal underwear. Love it. <laughs> and has your wife been supportive of that? Yeah, she's okay. She, she hadn't really said anything. Okay. So overall, and I'm going to ask you to speak for yourself and for her, but you, you can uh, say whatever you want to as you speak for her. But overall, uh, you know, number one, do you feel like the faith cri- your faith crisis has been overall positive on your marriage? Let's start there. Overall positive or negative or neutral on your marriage? Overall positive because we've grown so much, but it has been painful. So like lifting weights, it, it, it's painful, but it made you stronger. Yes. And, and I think um, I wouldn't take it back. So we, we are in such a better place than we've ever been. Um, and that's not to say we don't have our struggles all the time, but we are so much more authentic with each other. Um, I'm not afraid to talk about things uh, that are on my mind. And she knows me better than she's ever known me. There were many, many years where she didn't even know what was going on in my mind because I was afraid to bring it up because I didn't want to cause contention. Right. So better on your, better on your relationship, um, better on authenticity between you, stronger in the end. And our friendships are so much better too. Like the friendships that we have are just so rewarding and um, we just really enjoy spending time with authentic people and um, we're okay with some of the acquaintances that, that maybe weren't as authentic. We're, we're fine that those have gone by the wayside. Better friendships. How about as parents? Do you feel like you're better parents than you were as Orthodox, both Orthodox? I think so. Time will tell. I mean, certainly people would argue with that, that we're putting our kids at risk by leaving the church or, you know, that I'm putting my kids at risk by not being a good example to them or, you know, there, there's all sorts of fears that play into this, but I've gotten over that to some extent. And I've had some wonderful discussions with my kids about faith and about, um, you know, what we believe in and how we treat other people. And, um, you know, this, this generation that's grown up now, they're just very thoughtful and they really want to treat other people well. They're very concerned about people being treated equally and fairly. And we've just had some really great discussions about that. And um, I think I think my kids respect me where I am and I'm able to respect them. So it's good. So here's a hard question. Do you think your wife would say overall, she's glad you went through a faith crisis or do you think she, and and maybe you don't even know the answer, or do you think she would say, "I, I wish I could have my Orthodox Dan back? I don't know. I mean, I'm speaking for her. I I would say, I, I think she likes who I am now. And she expected when we got married that I was the Peter priesthood type, you know, and that I was going to be the rock of the family and me having a faith crisis basically turned her world upside down. But I think we can both look back on it now and see how it will bring us more happiness and more authenticity with each other and a deeper relationship. And there's not the same kind of fear there used to be. We, we can talk to each other about pretty much anything and not fear, you know, how the other person will react. And that just wasn't always the case in our marriage. So I, I hope it's better. Beautiful. Do you feel like you're more of an honest person now than you were before? Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm more open with people. Um, even with my patients, I'm willing to discuss things that maybe I wouldn't have discussed before. Um, I always had this fear of leaving a bad impression on the church or I I felt like I was like a representative and, you know, so you're always walking on eggshells. You don't want to say something that will make the church look bad or, you know, and I, I don't really worry about stuff like that anymore. I just, you know, and I also have, accepted my own, you know, that I'm just a man 
and that I'm not perfect and it's not expected for me to be perfect. And so I'm just okay with like people knowing stuff about me that, you know, like just doing this interview, you know, it's like people know stuff about me now. This has been, you know, they're, they're vulnerable moments, but I don't really care what people think about me. It, it doesn't matter. Um, so in that sense, I'm, I'm, I think more honest and more authentic and just willing to be me and willing to accept that I'm a messed up person, just like everybody else. And we're all just people and it's okay. Patricia writes, living a double life is unhealthy. That's what Patricia writes. Thanks for making that comment, Patricia. Um, Dan, what have you, do, have you uh, tried to piece together a sense of spirituality for yourself? Uh, do you still believe in God? Do you, are you, do you still consider yourself a Christian? Do you still pray? Have you found, are you secular? And even if you're secular, is spirituality important to you? Talk about that for just a second. Yeah, I'm very secular. If you had interviewed me six months ago, I probably would have defined myself as agnostic. Um, I mentioned to you that we went to Guatemala and uh, we went with the Presbyterian Church and did some uh, makeshift clinics there. And I had this experience while we were there. Um, on the, f the fourth day we were there, we were in this really uh, awful part of Guatemala City in this little concrete one room schoolhouse. Um, and we had like 120 patients in this little room that we were trying to treat. And I just had this very poignant experience that God was with us. Hmm. And it was just one of the most spiritual experiences I've ever had in my life. And to me, what that meant was wherever I am now, it's okay. And I don't need to be at a Mormon church or in a Mormon temple to have a spiritual experience, um, especially one that was so profound. And John, I, I wish I could tell you what I believe about God after that experience because I really don't know because um, I understand the psychology of it I understand that our emotions can be deceiving um, but to me regardless of that that was a special experience for me and I have hope that there's something else um, I have hope that when I die that that's not the end um, but you know what? If it is, I'm going to live every day to its fullest and make sure I take advantage of every opportunity that I have when I, I'm here to be happy and to be good to people and to have as full a life as possible. Um, so, so I don't really have specific doctrinal beliefs anymore, um, but I do have a spirituality. And, and I think I'd even say that there's I've, I've still like tried to maintain um, some mysticism in my life. Um, because I just don't think it's unhealthy to have that. I love it. So, um, yeah, there are a lot of post-Mormons that become atheist and agnostic, but there's also a lot that remain Christian or turn to Buddhism or uh, other types of things or just remain kind of nondescript spiritual believers. And I love it that you are finding what works for you. Yeah, it's a it's an ongoing process. Yeah, I love it. Um, all right, so uh, Wayne asks, "Are you seeking? Are you hopeful? Are you spiritual?" I think you've kind of answered that. But did you do you have anything to add to Wayne's question? Yeah, I would say I am a seeker. I, I'm more interested in in just finding truth, and I have, I'm not opposed to finding truth in other churches. I do really enjoy going to other churches. Um, I've expanded out and as a family, we try, I mentioned that my wife teaches Sunday school every other Sunday. And so as a family, we've tried to, on those off Sundays, go to other churches, explore other things. Um, and I've really enjoyed that process as a family and I enjoy spirituality still. So, and I, I really seek that out and I, uh, I like to read a lot, and so I'll still read Christian-themed books. I read books on the historicity of Jesus, and I also read books, um, you know, written by Christian apolog 
uh, apologist, so to speak. Um, and I'm just much less threatened now about, you know, um, finding truth. And I'm just willing to look for it wherever, wherever I can find it. I love it. Do you feel happier and more mentally healthy uh, for yourself now? Yeah, I mean, what's going on in here is is pretty messed up sometimes. Um, what do you still, mean? What do you mean by that? Just in general, I mean, I still struggle. I struggle with a lot of depression um, sometimes for no rhyme or reason. Sometimes I have really hard days in clinic, and I'm just really you know, down and just hating people and just, you know, wanting to be left alone. And um, I've dealt with a lot of materialism and trying to, you know, abandon that. And, you know, as a man, there's just things that, that go on that, um, you know, you're trying to deal with. So I don't want to make it seem like I live this blissful life because I don't. Especially, I should say, if you have the personality type of high anxiety, that's just rumination is going to be part of your battle, right? Absolutely. And there are many nights where I just lay in bed and I can't shut my mind off. My, my mind is just, just uh, churning, burning. And, um, you know, that's just the way it's always been. And, and you know, so that's not new. That's not new. No, no, that's not new at all. Okay. But I have abandoned this um, idea of perfectionism. So, and I've been much happier in that regard, just accepting myself for who I am. I'm, I'm a decent guy. I'm a good family man. I'm a good dad. Um, and I don't need to be perfect. And I'm much more okay with that now than I ever was when I was a more orthodox believer. Um, when I was more orthodox, I always felt pressure to do more. I always felt like I wasn't good enough. I always felt like I wasn't doing enough. I, if a bad thought came into my mind, um, I felt like I was a, like a bad person and I was always playing these games with myself and, and I have been able to, to abandon a lot of those games that I, I used to play in my mind about me being like some sort of evil person or um, not being a good Mormon or, or, you know, thinking God was mad at me or, you know, st stuff like that. I, I'm, I don't miss, I don't miss those thoughts at all. So in that sense, it's been an upgrade to, to, to kind of let go of perfectionism and anxiety about God's judgment and your worthiness quote. Yeah. The, the worthiness thing, like when we went to Guatemala with the Presbyterian church, you know, they were just like, I, I told the pastor, I said, look, just so you know, I I'm, I'm really struggling with my beliefs. I'm not even sure I believe in Christianity, you know, as you would define it. And he's like, okay, that's fine. We're just glad you're here to help. And, you know, just, <laughs> I was like, that's it. You know, aren't, aren't you going to interview me? You don't, uh, you're not going to kick me out of the trip. And, and he was fine with it. And we went and we had this wonderful experience and uh, it was just such a great uh, lesson to me that, you know, um, not all religions are, are like that. And, you know, there's not that judgment and that worthiness criteria that that's always hanging over our head. If you had to forecast, maybe this is impossible to do, the extent to which you think your wife and your family will remain active versus maybe fall away, do you even have a crystal ball to forecast? I don't know, but I'd say the chances that everyone will stay active are a lot, much less now than they were two years ago. Sure, sure. Um, do I see my kids going on missions? Uh, probably not. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I could see that maybe some of my children will be, you know, nuanced Mormons um, where they grow up kind of with a nuanced belief system, maybe like a New Order Mormon type, type of beliefs, but a belief set that they grew up with. So it's more normal for them and they don't feel like they're outside of the box. And that as the culture progresses and as the religion progresses, that they may be able to feel like they fit in and, and identify as Mormons. Um, I mean, I still, I still identify as a Mormon. Culturally, so, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see that it's not going to be a part of our life. I think it will be. Got it. All right. So as we wrap up this part of the interview, any final things you want to say to either people in faith crisis, people in a mixed faith marriage, either the non-believer or the believer, any final things you want to say about navigating that and what you've learned or what advice or wisdom you want to share? I guess I've learned that it's not the end of the world. 
um, you can get through it. Um, whether you're the, the believer or the non-believer, just be open and just deal with the pain and get through it. And it, it's, um, you can survive it. Um, and, and I also just want to emphasize, you know, sometimes these interviews do focus maybe more on the negative because we're talking about the transition, but I have just met the most beautiful people in Mormonism my whole life. And I don't want to marginalize that at all. I mean, this religion create, uh, has these wonderful people. And I think the church actually takes it for granted how wonderful their people are. Mm -hmm. and, um, and those relationships I have with our Mormon friends and e even you know, people who are still really active and, and true believers, um, they've just been really good relationships. And I think if you're just honest with people and try to stay positive, most people will accept you. And um, at least here in Tennessee, I don't find that it's a deal breaker with your friendships. And if it is, it's probably not that big of a deal. I love it. So uh, hang on for the ride, but lots of positive things can come out of a faith crisis less transition, whether you stay in the church or leave. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I would agree with that for sure. All right. Well, this is this concludes part one of my interview with Dr. Dan uh, Lonergan. And uh, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. We've got still got a great audience. Um, I'm just going to take literally three seconds to end this interview, and then we'll start up again with part two, which is going to be about your experiences as an expert uh, supporting people with addictions um, and treating people with addictions and preventing addictions and recovering from addictions um, once you've had them. So, uh, Dr. Dan, thanks for joining us today, and uh, we look forward to part two in just a second.